Welcome to Big Tent USA, especially to all the new friends who have joined us tonight. At Big Tent USA, we put democracy over partisanship. We're building a women-led voter coalition to protect the guardrails of democracy, ensure government accountability and transparency, and increase civic participation. Big Tent is gobsmacked, <laughs> truly, to welcome Heather Cox Richardson and Katie Corrick. We are so grateful to you incredible women who have brought more people under the tent than any of our previous speakers. Your teams know that over these last few days, we have had to keep enlarging our Zoom capacity <laughs> to allow for everyone who wants to be with you tonight. And we have talked out at 10,000 people. So thank you very much. Heather Cox Richardson is a professor of history at Boston College. She writes widely about reconstruction. You don't have this. Go get it. Uh, the Civil War and, oh, sorry, hang on. <laughs> I went too fast. Uh, the Civil War and the History of the Republican Party. She is the author of seven books, including the newly released Democracy Awakening. And if you don't, if you had, didn't receive one of our 200 copies, run to your local bookstore. Every American must read this book. As many of you attested to when you registered, reading Heather Cox Richardson's Letters from an American with a cup of tea or coffee is how you start your day. Heather, there were so many registrants who expressed their gratitude to you, but I wanted to share one person's note which summed up how so many feel. You are one of the most thoughtful and well-informed spokespersons in the country. For many people, I know you are a lifeline to sanity and hope in these confusing and unsettled times. Katie Corrick is an award-winning journalist and a number one, number one New York Times bestselling author of her memoir, Go memoir Going There. She is a co-founder of Stand Up to Cancer, which has raised more than $700 million for cancer research. As many of us know, she was the first woman to solo anchor a network evening newscast, serving as anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News from 2006 to 2011, following 15 years as the co-anchor of NBC's Today Show. In 2017, she founded Katie Couric Media, which has developed a number of media podcast uh, projects, including a daily newsletter, Wake Up Call, a fantastic podcast, podcast, which I highly recommend, Next Question, digital video series, and several documentaries. You can find it all at katiecouric.com. And with that, Heather and Katie, thank you again for coming to Big Tent and take it away. Kitty, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I was going to say I haven't been in front of this many people since I anchored the CBS Evening News, which is kind of a funny joke, but I think there are a, a number of you who have joined us, so I'm really thrilled. Heather, welcome. I am so excited to be able to have a conversation with you. My sister, Clara, who lives in Brookline, Massachusetts, told me about your, your newsletter, Letters from an American, a couple of years ago, and I was so excited to sign up, and now I'm an avid reader, and I especially love the photographs that you post when you're too tired to write your newsletter <laughs> uh, by Buddy, right? Right, right. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I can't wait to, to talk about all the things we're going to talk about, but I have to say, I hope the day comes when we can do this again to talk about the media, because I would love to hear what you have to say about this media moment we're in. Yeah, that would be great. Maybe we can do another conversation with Big Ten about that. And we'll probably touch on some of those things. But people really want to hear, obviously, Heather, from you. And I thought I'd start by asking you why you think your work is resonating so strongly with people. Obviously, we have thousands of people who are watching this Zoom. What is it? Why are people so hungry for this kind of information and content that you're providing on a daily basis? Well, of course, I can't speak for anybody but myself, but I think what the whole project of the Letters from an American is, is to try and, and return us to a reality-based community. So much of what we have heard, certainly in the last six years, and before that, the last 20 years, and going back at least 40 years, and maybe even a little bit into the 1950s, we've faced the news 
without being able really to untangle what is really happening and what is not. And there's so much of an attempt to, to, to whip up our emotions. And because I'm a historian, I'm, I'm not part of that. I'm interested in trying to figure out exactly what happened without bringing the emotions to it so much as trying to find the patterns that lie within it. And that idea of, of centering ourselves back on the ledge you know, the, the bedrock of fact as opposed to spin or even lies, I think is a, is very attractive to a lot of people. It certainly is to me. Even if I don't agree with what's happening, I feel like my feet are under me. You know what? I feel like it's it's also not only grounded in fact, but you really utilize historical context. And I love when someone is helpful in connecting the dots and why something is happening and reaching back in our past to kind of explain certain events. Why do you think more people aren't doing that in, in terms of the media landscape? And you're, you're somewhat of an outlier in that department. Well, first of all, it, it helps that I have a doctorate in history and have been teaching history, <laughs> studying history since the 1980s. So when somebody says, for example, the other night, somebody said to me, what is our Kansas, Nebraska moment? I knew what he was talking about, right? Which not everybody would. So I do have the background in American history and in the theories of American history. But I also think that what historians and journalists do is actually different. You know, journalists find the stories and they tell you what the stories are. And historians look at the longer picture to see patterns in how societies change. So in a way it's easier for a historian to say, okay, let me tell you about the speaker of the house, but but then let me tell you about how this has changed and why it matters. And that's just something that I've been trained to do that, that many journalists have not been. So I think it's easier for me than it would be for somebody who has a different set of training than I do. Having said that, the level of knowledge about basic uh, you know, facts and, and civics is woefully bad. A survey by the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation found that only one in three Americans are capable of passing the US citizen, citizenship exam. Um, why are Americans or why are many Americans so woefully undereducated or about sort of the basic principles of our democracy? And that must really drive you crazy, Heather. You know, it doesn't really drive me crazy. I think that people are wired to learn. It's just a question of what they learn. And one of the things that I think we're grappling with right now is that I think for a lot of us, we assumed that American democracy was always going to be in place. So we didn't really have to think about it. We didn't have to worry about it. We didn't have to make sure the guardrails were there because it was going to be okay. They were always going to be there. And now, of course, that we're aware that those guardrails are disappearing and that people don't, in fact, know how our system works, you know, memorably a senator didn't know the three branches of government, which that, okay, that blew my mind. Um, people are recognizing that they need to know. And I saw it in my students uh, at least 20 years ago, but the degree to which people who in the past didn't seem to care at all about the mechanics of our democracy are coming up to me now and saying, wait a minute, explain the electoral college again. You know, I think now that we need to know those things again, people are learning them. And, and that's a wonderful thing. I, I would hope that in the future, we never take democracy for granted again, and we continue to focus on those things so that we don't get into a moment where we are now, where you know people don't even understand, for example, what the Speaker of the House does, or perhaps get elected to the Senate without knowing that there are three branches of government. I think there should be a refresher course like we do with CPR, you know, because people get busy, their lives are crazy. And I think it's always helpful to just remind people, even if this is something they've learned long ago, some of the basic principles. In the opening paragraphs of your book, Democracy Awakening, you write, quote, that democracies die more often at the ballot box than at gunpoint. But why would voters give away their power to autocrats? who inevitably destroy their livelihoods and sometimes execute their neighbors. So let me ask you that question. Can you explain for us how and why this happens, Heather? Why people vote to give up their democracies? That's a really important concept to begin with. The idea that people are uh, 
are, are voting to give up their democracies when when they sort of feel that I think that that the democracy is safe so long as you don't have tanks in the street. But the question of why a very small group, it's almost never more than 30 percent of a population, decides that they want to overthrow a democracy is because at the higher levels, they are a minority and recognize that they if the if the majority begins to exercise its power, the the unusual amount of power that a very few elites are exercising will fall apart, but but they need foot soldiers. And those foot soldiers tend to give up on democracy when they feel as if they have been left behind somehow, either religiously or economically or culturally, socially, and they become susceptible to a strong man who promises to return them to significance, the kind of significance that they felt they had in the past. When that happens, when they decide that they are willing to support any man who will promise to put the right people in office and follow the right traditional rules, they decide that looks better than the current world in which they're living, in which people they don't like seem to be gaining power. And we're very much there right now. If you look, for example, at what has been happening in the House of Representatives, for example, you have a very small minority of people who managed to shut down our government and gain control of it because they were afraid of what would happen if, in fact, you did have things like the, the requirement that things that were popular in both the Democratic side of the House and in the Republican side of the House could come to a vote. I mean, that's democracy. We would think we would like that. To them, it was such a threat that they decided to really shut down our government for three weeks while they found somebody who would guarantee that could never happen. Aren't there sometimes macro external forces, though, that create this seismic shift uh, in, a, in a society in terms of, of the way people react and the, you know, the the number of people who want to really usher in radical change. For example, things, things like globalization, things like uh, a reduction in manufacturing and a hollowing out of towns all across America. Um, I would imagine those have a tremendous impact on the way people think, behave, and, and vote. Yes, but that's part of the, the the Republican project in the 1980s and the 1990s was the focus on markets to regulate the economy rather than actual regulation from the government with the idea that that would enable wealth to concentrate among a small group of people who would in turn invest it in such a way that it would provide jobs for everybody and all boats would rise together, right? But we know from 1981, any statistic you look at will show you that what happened was the middle class got utterly hollowed out. Wealth concentrated concentrated dramatically at the top of the scale. And there's a, a large number of people who did, in fact, feel economically left behind. They became very vulnerable to the idea that somebody was stopping them from achieving the kind of middle class life or upper middle class life to which they aspired. And that then, of course, turned into the idea that those others, you know, black people, brown people, women who wanted to work outside the home were threatening them and, and created this toxic stew that I think is playing out now. Let's go back because I want to pick it, pick at your, you know, big history brain back to 1937 and something called the Conservative Manifesto. I know that you discuss this a lot in your book, but can you explain what it is and how it served as a blueprint for many Republicans moving forward? So that's a great moment that has not gotten a lot of play in other places. And the, the reason I like it is because, listen to what happened. It's 1937. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democrat who has ushered in the New Deal, that's the idea of business regulation and a basic social safety net and the promotion of internal improvements like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was designed to bring electricity, for example, to regions of Tennessee that were you know, still living in darkness at night. Um, and he gets reelected. There's a lot of people when he starts to, to organize the New Deal who look at him and think, oh, this is just a complete anathema. We need to get rid of this. We need to go back to the kind of programs we had in the 1920s where businessmen controlled society. And they expect that he's going to be a, you know, a, a one trick pony and get thrown out of office 
1936, and instead he's reelected. So in 1937, a number of Republican pro-businessmen who are very concerned about business regulation, they're not so concerned about taxes in this period, they don't want business regulation, join together with Southern Democrats who don't like the inroads that the New Deal is beginning to make on racial segregation in the American South. And they decide that they need to come up with an ideological explanation for why it's important to go back to the 1920s, even though it's clear that people like the New Deal. And what they do is they write, they get together literally over lunch at one point, and they write this document that becomes known as the Conservative Manifesto. And I actually started this book with the Conservative Manifesto of 1937, because what they say is that the way the American government should work is that there should be no regulation of business, because that hampers a man's ability to run his business as he wants, and that um, affects his, it, uh, it, it hurts his property rights. There should be no social safety net because churches should handle that. There should be no internal improvements by the federal government because that too should be handled by, you know, individual entrepreneurs. And as far as any kind of racial equality being enforced by the federal government, absolutely not. They doubled down on what they called home rule, which was essentially saying that Southern states could treat African-Americans however they wished. The reason that I focused on that for the beginning of this book is, don't you feel like you could pick those very arguments up and plop them down in 2023 and you could identify current lawmakers who are making those exact same arguments? That ideology that would take the United States back to the period of the 1920s before the New Deal is the one that came to shape the, the, the present day Republican Party. So that document, which died very quickly, and it, it got leaked to the press. And when people found out that it was going on, you know, the Republicans ran away and said, we want to, we want to criticize FDR on our own. And the Democrats were like, we're not going to, you know, criticize our own president. But it gets picked up. It gets picked up by chambers of commerce. It gets picked up by segregation newspapers. It gets picked up by a lot of people in the countryside at large who have reasons not to like the New Deal. So that idea there in 1937 feels to me very much like almost 100 years later, we are still dealing with the fallout from that document. And before we talk about current day, I want to talk about how the word conservative evolved uh, from the time of Abraham Lincoln to the 50s and the emergence of movement conservatives. So that's fun. One of the things that you will notice if you read my letters is I don't describe the current day Republican Party as conservative because conservatism is an ideology. It's a theory. It was actually really initiated by Edmund Burke during the French Revolution. And he said some very important things when he talked, I have to say, at great length about his political theories. And one of them was that he looked across the channel to the French Revolution and he said, you know, it's not a good idea for a government to try and impose an ideology on a people, because pretty soon lawmakers are going to care more about the ideology than they do about the people. And they're going to try and fit those people into that ideology. And when they don't fit, heads will roll. Look what's happening in France. Instead, he said governments really should focus on stability. They should try and make sure that, that communities are stable. And he comes up with a number of ways in which he thinks they can do that by supporting churches, by supporting the aristocracy, by supporting all kinds of things that will impose uh, security and, and stability on a society. That's really different than the modern day conservatives who in fact are trying to rip up the same things that uh, had created stability in the United States after the depression beginning in 1933, uh, first when the Democrats put in place the New Deal and then when Eisenhower and the Republicans pick those theories up or pick those ideas up with what they call the middle way. And that's the creation of a government that regulates business, protects the social safety net, promotes infrastructure, and defends civil rights in the states. So the idea of, of the current day Republicans being conservatives is taken from that conservative manifesto, but they're not actually conservatives. I've called them, and I believe they are, dangerous radicals. Now, there's a sleight of hand there, though, because one of the things that modern day Republicans often point to is that Lincoln called himself a conservative. So what do you do with that? That was so much fun to track down because it turns out that when Edmund Burke first starts talking about conservatism, Americans don't care about conservatism. Their country's brand new. They got nothing they want to conserve. So they don't really focus on that term. It begins to be used in the United States in 1850. 
when a number of Northerners who opposed the, the, the spread of human enslavement and the measures that were put in place in the Compromise of 1860 to protect human enslavement started to say, we're not going to, we're not going to adhere to that law. And Southern enslavers say, you're radicals, you're radicals because you're not paying attention to laws. Well, abolitionists look at this and they start to say, wait a minute, no, we're the ones who are trying to preserve the Declaration of Independence. We are the conservatives. And it's Abraham Lincoln who picks that up by the end of the 1850s and begins to describe his determination to protect the concept of human equality as conservative. This is a conservative statement. And he literally says to Southern enslavers, he says, listen, you call us radicals? You're the ones who are trying to spread enslavement. You're the ones who are taking over the West. You're the ones who are trying to turn this entire democracy into an oligarchy. We, those of us who are protecting the concept of human equality are the true conservatives. And this is, you know, I, sometimes I, I get a little cheeky and describe myself as a conservative because I'm a Lincoln conservative. I believe in equality before the law and I believe that we should all have a right to a say in our government. Very different than movement conservatives, correct? Movement conservatives are those in the 1950s who picked up that, that conservative manifesto idea of going back to the 1920s. And they, when, when uh, they they're really get their feet under them in 1951 with William F. Buckley Jr.'s God and Man at Yale or the Superstitions of Academic Freedom, in which he begins to say, listen, everybody agrees that the government should do all these things that the New Deal and the Middle Way have put in place. I guess he's not talking about the Middle Way then because it's 51, but the New Deal is put in place. But, but I disagree with them. So we should start with the idea that um, we should promote Christianity and we should promote what he calls free market um, uh, individualism. And with that, and then in a following book in 1954, when he and L. Brent Bazell defend McCarthy, uh, Joe McCarthy, who, and, and they say, the world is really divided between liberals, capital L liberals, and by that they mean Democrats and Republicans, both who believe in this act of government, uh, and conservatives, which they call themselves, the idea that they are the only true people protecting America. And what they want to do is they want to go back to the 1920s. They become known as movement conservatism later on, but they happily grab that title because they are a political movement. They are not ideological conservatives like Burke. They are instead a political movement that calls itself conservative, the same way as I always like to say that the Fox News Channel is called the Fox News Channel. That does not mean it is news. It is solely their name. Let's talk about the night. I have a lot, I have a lot to say about that, but we'll do that another time. Let's talk about what happened in the 60s. You write that Democrats started to back away from articulating their values in the 60s, and that, that opened up a pathway for movement conservatives. Can you elaborate on what you were talking about there? So what happens in 1960 is that, as I say, it is so widely believed that all Americans share this belief in an active government that does the things I've talked about, that there's no real reason political scientists say to talk about it anymore, because we're all agreed. In fact, in order to build coalitions, what political parties should do is try and nail together groups of people that they promise uh, they will help going forward if they, in fact, gain office. And the, the Republicans decide to go this way, but they begin to pick up the language of movement conservatives. The Democrats, in contrast, also follow the lead of the Republicans in the late 1960s. But the, the Democrats and the Republicans do two very different things. And one of the things that happens in 1965 is with the Voting Rights Act, both Republicans and Democrats have to decide whether they're going to try and incorporate new black and brown voices into their political coalition or run away from that. Long story short, the Republicans decide to run away from it and to double down on the idea of a white base on which they're going to rely. The Democrats instead try to, uh, to, to create a multicultural democracy. When they're shellacked in, 60, uh, in, uh, in 68 and then finally in 72, they begin to back away from that. And that coincides with the rise of the new left. And one of the things that really matters about the new left is that it's important to remember that there's a difference between liberalism and people on the left, which we could talk about. But one of the things the new left really emphasizes is rather than than having working together with with labor unions, for example, and with big, big tent coalitions, that they're really going to focus on individual uh, 
expression of their individuality. So what that does is it tends to break down the organized labor coalitions with the Democrats, for example. It tends to break down the idea of moving society forward as big blocks of people coming together to support a political party and really focuses on individual identity. At the same time, the Republicans are doing exactly the opposite. So I think one of the things as well that we're seeing today is that in this moment, both parties are finally grappling with the end game that began in 1965, the Republicans doubling down on uh, what certainly looks to be a, a white male polity in which they're trying to, to get rid of the voting of other people and trying really to focus on that really minority of American history. And the Democrats under President Joe Biden are really trying to make a multicultural democracy a reality. We know, for example, that Biden has more women in his White House than men and has appointed more uh, Black women judges to office than anybody before him. I mean, there's a lot of ways in which they're trying to do that. So I think that that what, what's happening in this period from the 60s to the present is really a larger question of how do you create a multicultural democracy and what is the role of larger um, organizations in that political system. How have marginalized Americans, you write about this, been so instrumental in the enduring strength of our democracy? And, and when you talk about marginalized Americans, what do you, who do you, who are you talking about? So that was the coolest part of writing this book. The book began as a series of essays, short essays to answer the questions people ask me every day. And it quickly became clear to me that what people ask me most is how did we get here? what's going on and how do we get out of it? So I wrote those things and I put the manuscript aside um, for about four months. And when I picked it back up, it turned out that it had done something very similar to what happens in a classroom when it's going really well. And you teach students, but if you leave them alone, sometimes they build something way bigger than, than you, way bigger than the class. And it's always, a, it's always a surprise. And this is actually why this book is dedicated to my readers is because when I picked up that manuscript, what I saw was a very different story than I had set out to write. And I ended up rewriting about 80% of the book because what I saw was that in the United States, what is, has been crucial to the survival of our democracy and the expansion of our democracy since the very beginning was that once the, the founders who wrote the Declaration of Independence put into writing, into a document, that we all have the right to be treated equally before the law and we all have a right to a say in our government, principles that, that never occurred to them would ever include women, people of color, you know, they, they really thought it meant them, you know, and, and white men, white men of property. Well, but once they put those principles into writing, what they had done is given a set of tools to people who were not included in that, people of color, black people, women, um, you know, <coughs> across the board, people who were not included in that, the tools to say, these are great ideas, what about me? And, and one of the things that I that really jumped out to me was that the United States didn't fall to fascism in the 1920s, and it certainly looked like it could have. We came perilously close to it. But why not? And I think the reason that we have managed to stay steady, really, um, on a course toward democracy since the beginning has been that marginalized Americans have constantly kept in front of us the principles that are enshrined in that Declaration of Independence. And with them, they have been able since the beginning continually to expand where we are and what our democracy looks like to include more and more people. And that I think is, is inspirational as well as a way to look at our history that offers a way for us both to honor our, our illustrative past, our, our, the, the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence, but also to recognize that it's the rest of us who put those principles into life. So let's talk about sort of the political minority, because you're talking in marginalized people who are uh, exerting pressure on the status quo to change so we can become a more pluralistic society. But you also write a lot about a political minority that created the perfect environment for a figure like Donald Trump. You, you write, quote, Trump, that Trump, quote, quite deliberately 
tap into that emotional anger that he could spark with racism and sexism. How is this strategy drawn directly from the authoritarian playbook, Heather? So you, you just identified something really important there is that it's one thing to talk about um, racial minorities um, or gender minorities, the, the sorts of people that I'm describing as marginalized and a political minority, because I talk about both in the books in the book and they have a very different meaning in, in what they're doing. So the Republican Party has a real problem or had a real problem beginning with Reagan because Reagan is elected by 50.1% of the vote. That's not that's not a, you know, a mandate. That's 51 point, 50.1% of the vote. And it's pretty clear from the beginning that not a lot of people buy into his agenda. And, and it doesn't go very well. People don't remember that because we have really mythologized the Reagan years. But it looks, in fact, as if after his reelection in 18, 1984, when the Republican Party puts in place the tax cuts of 1986, that they are not going to stay in place. There's a backlash against Reaganism. And there have been tax cuts in 81 and there are tax cuts again in 86. When that happens, uh, Republicans recognize that in order to protect their vision, this idea that we should get rid of the New Deal state and instead replace it with this emphasis on markets and on the concentration of wealth, that they're going to need to do something because that's not very popular. So as early as 1986, they begin to talk about ballot integrity which their private memos say they expect will throw black people out of the vote, you know, throw them off the voting rolls. From 1986 forward, the Republican Party makes a, a, a terrible but a classic mistake in politics. And that is that they begin, rather than to, to, to try and answer the, the requests of voters, the needs of voters, they begin to choose their voters and to, to look at a smaller and smaller group of people and to manipulate the system so that they can run it. So we get the suppression of votes increasing after uh, 1998, when Florida begins to actually have uh, some voter suppression measures that are going to have huge effects in 2000. Those voter suppression acts, of course, continue until we get a Shelby v. Holder and uh, the decisions that come after that Shelby v. Holder of 2013, when we start to see the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. Um, but then we also get uh, gerrymandering, the idea that people should be able to, that lawmakers should be able to choose their voters. So, of course, after 2010 and Operation Red Map, we get the extraordinary gerrymandering of a number of Republican and dominated states, and that continues until this moment. So what we've ended up with is a political party that increasingly focused on a minority. But in order to, to continue to fire up that minority, they increasingly uh, heated up their rhetoric to suggest that the rest of us are dangerous, that we are socialists, that we are um, trying to destroy America, that we are, in fact, so far beyond what is acceptable behavior in the United States that we shouldn't even, for example, be able to elect a president. That's the outcome of, of the 2020 presidential election. And the problem with that, of course, is it has an immediate problem for our democracy. But as a theory, it's also a huge problem because if you have a system, and I understand you're going to have um, Steve Levitsky and um, uh, uh, Dan Ziblatt talking, uh, Ziblatt talking about this. The problem for democracy is that it's supposed to be majority rule, right? We're supposed to have protections for a minority, but we're supposed to have faith that the people we want to have in office get into office. And once you have lost that, you have lost the emotional and the practical buy-in to a democracy of the majority of voters. And what that means is they will no longer care to support that government. And that never goes well. So, so that is one thing that happens when you get extraordinarily gerrymandered districts is you no longer have to worry about actually appealing to voters. I mean, you look, for example, at a safe district like Representative Lauren Boebert in Colorado. I mean, that was, I believe it was a plus 17 district uh, when she was elected. She lost, uh, I mean, she won her last election by about 500 votes. So she's lost a lot of that goodwill, but it makes it so that you don't have to worry about getting reelected. You have to worry about getting on TV and spreading the message. There is that. I wonder a little bit too, if it is about um, not wanting to be ostracized from their friends. You know, Washington always seems to me to be kind of a small place. And well, it's true. You look, Heather, at what Mitt Romney did, and he was completely marginalized. The book that just came out about him talks about him eating by himself on 
you know, a TV tray eating salmon that Lisa Murkowski sent him with on a hamburger bun with ketchup, which sounds awful, but that's another subject. But the fact that he did speak out and there was absolutely no reward. You look at Liz Cheney or Adam Kinziger. I mean, they are they are in no man's land or no woman's land when it comes to the Republican Party. So I think people see Profiles in Courage, which Liz Cheney won, I think, in, at the at uh, the Kennedy Library, and they think, well, great, you know, she's courageous, but her political uh, her political career, if if not over, has been significantly thwarted, right? Well, so this is what's so interesting, though. I, yes, I agree with you, but. This has been the product, I think, of convincing Americans that their voices didn't matter. And this is why, to me, the moment we're in is so incredibly exciting. Because, no, you're never going to get change the opinions of somebody like Ron Johnson in the Senate um, from Wisconsin, who is going to do what he's going to do. But the more of us who speak up and who try to take back our agency and remind people that this is a democracy and we get to have a say in our government, the more likely it is to change that ship of state. So for example, one of the things that I like to point to is that you know Clarence Thomas just recused himself from sitting on a January 6th case. He would not have done that two years ago. He did that because he's in real trouble politically. But a better example, I think, and one that's very much on the table now in places like Ohio, and I would suggest even in Virginia, and certainly now with a new Speaker of the House, um, who's made his principles quite known, um, is the issue of abortion. So, of course, the idea of getting rid of Roe versus Wade, the 1973 decision that um, that recognized the constitutional right to an abortion was always sort of a carrot out there for people on the, the for the radical right. Nobody. I'm not saying, shouldn't say nobody. The, the general sense was that nothing would happen. Well, when those radicals managed to get the Dobbs decision, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health through in June of 2022, what they'd done is they had in fact overturned what has always been a pretty popular decision. You know, a vast majority of people liked Roe versus Wade. So at first there were all these public signings and people were handing out pens because they were the ones who'd had the most draconian abortion law put in place. Now they're doing it, but they're doing it in private. They're trying not to call attention to it. They're trying to change the way they talk about abortion because they're concerned that voters are turning against them. And why is that? Because in every special election since the Dobbs decision that involved the issue of abortion, Democrats have overperformed by eight points right. at a time when most elections are decided by less than a point. Um, so the, the idea of taking back our agency and, and insisting on our lawmakers actually representing the majority of us, I think is, our moment is here. I will add though, personally to what you just said about people like Mitt Romney, is that I am personally angry at the senators who went along with this for the time they did. And in the, the recent uh, fight over Jim Jordan becoming Speaker of the House when people were complaining about, you know, how mean that their colleagues were being to them and that they were getting threats and all that. All I could think of was all of those of us across the board, but really in the academy, who have dealt with the kinds of things that have been thrown at us for the last six years and told we are snowflakes. And I just find it so personally offensive that somebody could be elected to national office and refuse to take a principled stand out of fear because of what's coming their way. You know, you did it to all the rest of us without our consent, without us putting our names out there, without us running for office. So the fact that they were unwilling to do it themselves, there are very few things that make me personally angry, and that is one of them. You said, and I want to ask you about the new Speaker of the House, but I want to ask you about uh, what you've written about a second Trump pre presidency. You say it would mean an end of American democracy. Yes. Why? Well, I, I, I would like to preface that by saying that every strong man falls. That's a given. But they do a lot of damage before they fall. So you're better off not putting them in place to begin with. The reason that I that I I don't I am I am I am 
convinced that a Trump presidency will end American democracy, not by the way that people like me would stop fighting for it, um, but because of what he has said and what his people have said uh, in the last few years. So it was a, an extraordinarily chilling moment that should have had much more attention when he suggested that the now former Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, had been disloyal to him, he had therefore committed something like treason, and in the past, the punishment for that was execution. That was somebody who wants to become the President of the United States, calling the most powerful military figure in our country, and therefore also on the globe, a, tra a traitor, and calling for his death because he was not loyal to Donald Trump. I mean, that's just one of a million things that Trump has said that is so outrageous and hard to believe. And yet he is leading in the polls. And when you when you see that day after day, despite his rhetoric, despite the things he says, does that may sort of um, challenge credulity. I mean, what is the explanation? I think there are a lot of explanations right now. Uh, one, of course, is we're still a year out. So this feels really intense to people like you and me, but a lot of people are just not paying attention yet. I also think it's worth remembering that he has been under really quite tight wraps since 2016, both in the White House and then after that. I think voters are going to be really surprised when they see how he has deteriorated because he has deteriorated a lot if you watch him. Um, and also because I think that people are not paying the kind of attention perhaps that they could to what's actually happening in the Biden administration, which has done, uh, I mean, just astonishing things, uh, both domestically in the, the expansion of domestic manufacturing and in the recovery of the American economy, um, but also internationally nailing together coalitions that were falling apart under Trump and that Trump has promised to tear apart again. Why do, you think they, why do you think the Biden administration doesn't get more credit? So I, I almost want to throw that back to you. Um, it, it does feel to me like we are dealing with a press that insists on judging everything like a horse race rather than like the, the, what's at stake. You think that's fair? Yeah, I think that's that's it's been ever thus. And I think someone actually said, can we trust polls, which I think is a really good point. We seem to rely consistently on polling data, which has been shown to be highly inaccurate. And, um, you know, I think part of it is is journalists don't get into the middle of the country enough and really talk to voters and understand, you know, help help kind of elucidate what matters to people in their daily lives. I also think some of the things are long term, like the infrastructure bill, until people start seeing bridges in their own communities or highways being repaired. Some of it, I think, seems almost um, amorphous and hard hard for people to really grasp until they actually experience in their day-to-day -day lives. You know, though, I, th yeah, I agree with that. I also think there's something else going on though too. And that is that it's not cool to say you believe in American democracy, right? Ever since Vietnam and Watergate, it's been much easier to complain bitterly about whatever the government is doing because it's always doing something wrong. And, you know, you asked at the start of this, why people read me and what they see in it. And, and the answer to that, I really think often is that I'm, I'm willing to say, to put my heart out there and say, yeah, I believe in this enterprise. I believe in American democracy. You know, I think what's happening is good. And that is, um, I think it's much easier, especially as a reporter to try and, and find the, the, the bad things well, I also think that things. I think journalists bend over backwards because they don't want to seem partisan, even though sometimes I think it's not right and wrong. It's not left and right. It's right and wrong at this point in terms of the way leaders are behaving. But I think there is still that that inclination to kind of trying to be even handed uh, no matter what. And I think that that, um, you know, is a spillover from sort of what journalists were taught about being objective and trying to show both sides. But I think, you know, in this current climate, doing that has been really, really difficult. And um, I think that's part of the problem too. 
Do you think it do you think it's possible too that journalists kind of hold back because social media makes it so possible to get so much pushback no matter what you say? Yes. I, well, I don't know. I think so. I mean, I think some journalists like to be extremely provocative on social media because that's how you get a lot of engagement. And Kara Swisher, who's a good friend of mine, who, who's a great journalist, talks about engagement through enragement. And I think part of the problem is instead of like building up your person, it's all about throwing bombs at the other side. So I think the cacophony of that kind of overwhelms the ecosystem. And, and kind of sort of talking in, in sensible, rational ways, the way you do in your newsletter, honestly, is not, it's not gonna get the attention that people are seeking. But you, but you say that, I mean, so I've heard that before. You say that and it's like, there are literally millions of people who are following a history professor from Maine. You cannot tell me that this is not a viable model for other people to use. I think, I I wish it were. I mean, I'm not, and that, well, I mean, I think the networks are trying to do that, but then you get into cable. And I mean, this is for our next discussion. And that I think in an increasingly fragmented media landscape, they're trying to get at least a core audience of true believers, right? Who want their reviews want their views kind of reflected back at them. They want their views reinforced by the people they're watching. And so this idea of a more sensible conversation, talking about policy, I think, honestly, it doesn't, it doesn't connect with people on a visceral level. And I'm not sure it brings people back. You know, you, NewsHour does that, you know, and they're, they're uh, you know, they're, their audience is pretty small. So I don't know. You would you would think, you would hope, and I sure would be grateful if that existed myself. But um, you know, right now we have a very bifurcated media system with people who adhere to one ideology against people who adhere to another. But so isn't that really what places like Big Tent are trying to do, and certainly what I'm trying to do. In fact, I'm trying to do exactly the same thing, is reflect people's values back to them. And those values are fact-based reality and support for democracy. Right. And that, I mean, one of the things that I think you can do with history, but I think you could also do it without using history, is have bedrock principles that are pluralistic, that support democracy, and that try and do, um, you know, try and get, I always think of it as getting underneath the partisanship. Right. Because when I'm writing about Lincoln, I'm not writing about today's Democrats or today's Republicans. I'm writing about the principles that Lincoln embraced. And, you know, you wouldn't have to do that as a historian, but but in a way you are reflecting back perhaps a kind of tribalism, but it's a tribalism that is re- that is rooted in, you know, humanistic principles that, that I think a lot of people really like. Yeah, I mean, I agree. So maybe you can start a network, Heather. Well, you know, actually, I wrote down on uh, on this, this my note thing here, uh, Katie Couric Media, ask her about this. Okay, well, we can do that another time because there are a lot of questions from our audience and I want to get to that too. I want, But I do want to ask you about Joe Biden. He'll, he'll turn 81 next month. You said it's it makes him, quote, older than dirt, but you say his age is I actually- say that, benefit. that was rude. <laughs> <laughs> you say his age is actually uh, a benefit. And um, I'd love you to talk about that because that is obviously- a, a huge focus on uh, a, a huge focus of a lot of people in terms of his candidacy and his uh, seeking re-election. So one of the things that that somebody said to me when I was much younger, which I think is valuable, and that is that none of us knows when the end is coming, and that um, is worth thinking about. Um, so that nobody's got any guarantees, right? So the reason I said that I thought his age was valuable is because he remembers a time when people could act not uh, by, on, by, on a bipartisan basis. He remembers a time when democracy really worked and he understands the idea that putting 
the uh, the weight of the federal government behind ordinary Americans uh, to re revive the system that we had before it began to be torn apart in the 1980s is extraordinarily valuable. So I think domestically, he represents an older time that he is trying to bring forward again by changing it. I don't think he's he's trying to revive the New Deal. I think he's trying to do very similar things, um, but with some changes. I mean, he's using a lot more private investment than the New Deal did. And at the same time, he's also trying to center children rather than centering heteronormative husbands, right? But um, but but I think it where it really becomes valuable, and this I absolutely did not see coming in 2020. And in fact, I believe I even said to somebody that Joe Biden's international experience didn't matter because the next four years weren't going to have anything to do with foreign affairs, which can I just say I don't think I could ever have been wronger. Um <laughs> Think about the fact that he managed to pull together a coalition, both of NATO and of our allies and partners around the world to support Ukraine when Russia invaded in February of 2022. I It literally keeps, keeps me up at night to think of what would have happened if uh, the former President Trump had been in office, had been reelected, because he said he was going to destroy NATO. So you're taking a look at, at the time, our two biggest geopolitical foes in, in February 2022 were China and Russia. They had just made an alliance in early February that was supposed to be a no-holds-barred alliance. If Trump had been in office, NATO had been destroyed, which, by the way, Blinken, uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and um, President Joe Biden had been working since they'd gotten in office to rebuild. Um, if Trump had destroyed those and and... Putin had pushed into those four oblasts that he had been saying he wanted since 2016. That was part of the deal in 2016. I just reread that testimony the other day that was interesting. Um, he now has far more territory that has control over much of the world's food supply, and he has fabulous harbors, right? So now he's stronger than he was before, and all the internal uh, trouble that was, was evidenced by People like Alexei Navalny's, they need to throw him in, in prison for so long because there was a real protest movement developing against Putin. That's gone now. So, so he's got his, Russia's getting big and getting bigger. And now it's starting to push up against Europe, but Europe, but NATO has fallen apart at the same time that Russia and China have aligned and are really mm -hmm. pushing the idea of destroying democracy. They've said they want to destroy democracy. The United States, of course, at that point is torn apart if Trump had become elected in 2020 because he already said, and he said he will do it in the future, that he was going to get rid of our nonpartisan civil service and make everybody loyal to him. It looks to me, if that were the case, that democracy in this moment would utterly be on the ropes. We'd have the rise of authoritarians, the rise of their global power in uh, Russia and China. And of course, if Russia were powerful, Belarus would very much be on board. Hungary would be on board. Turkey would be on board. You know, the, the world would not be what it is today. And I really think that what we have to thank for this, and by the way, Europeans will tell you the same thing, but we have to thank for this is Biden's extraordinary skill at foreign affairs and the fact he he knows some of these people because mm -hmm. he's been around for so long. Mm -hmm. So I think his age, you know, one of the things we have a really good crop of young people coming of young people. I'm just speaking like an old woman, but but you know, the 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 next crop of politicians that are in their 40s and 50s, they're really, really, really good across the board. But we don't have the kind of depth of foreign policy experience in any of them yet, although Kamala, Vice President Kamala Harris is certainly getting it now, that we had in Joe Biden. I, you know, I, I venture to say he is one of the most skilled in the country, but he is certainly the most skilled president in foreign affairs that we've had since at least Eisenhower. And that's saying something. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of pushback in the comments about asking about that and, and mentioning Joe Biden's age. And it's true. A lot of people don't mention that Donald Trump, by the way, is three years younger than Joe Biden. And um, and, and, and I think that's definitely a valid point. Um, but I, I want to ask you before we have to wrap up about our new Speaker of the House. I watched his speech today. I was getting a... Um, skin check, everyone get their skin check so they don't have skin cancer at the dermatologist and the TV was on. And so I watched pretty much his whole speech. Uh, Mike, Mike Johnson from Shreveport, Louisiana, the first, I guess, Speaker of the House ever from Louisiana. 
What did you, I, I don't know, Heather, if you got a chance to watch his speech, but what mm -hmm. do you think of that? And what do you think of the insane shit show? Am I allowed to say that on something like this? I guess I can. You did, so um, you did. That, was, that, that led up to finally getting a Speaker of the House. So I did not see anything today. I was on the road all day. Um, but what, what I see is this, and I'm really interested in it. Um, we talked a bit about minority rule. What we saw with the defenestration, if you will, of Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, the, in the beginning of this right. session, um, was the a, very, a handful of Republicans throwing out their speaker. And, and no, the Democrats should not have helped with that. They have been very clear that they would like to proceed on a bipartisan basis, but they are not going to support somebody who, for example, has opened impeachment and impeachment inquiry into a president who clearly has done nothing wrong. This that's all an attempt to keep propaganda rolling. So first they threw out him. And then, of course, we lurched back and forth. Uh, Steve Scalise was the next person um, that the conference right. nominated. And again, a small group of Republicans said, we're not going to go with majority rule, even in our conference. We disagree. So then they tried Jim Jordan. And when they, they put Jim Jordan up, he then physically threatened people. You know, this is again, this is these are this is what strong men do. And he's very much approached he was a huge election denier and you know, led the charge about the rigged election. And so so, so the new guys, right. So, so finally, we've got this guy who's very much in the Trump court. He's very much a Trump uh, acolyte across the board, anti-abortion, anti-gay marriage. I mean, he's really a radical. It is extraordinarily concerning both that they shut down our government for three weeks in the middle of, of the term, but also that now we have the front runner for the Republican Party having openly given up on democracy and now the Republican House. The reason I find this interesting is because if this doesn't wake up the American people to how dangerous the Trump movement is, nothing will. And in our past, when we had a similar, something similar happen in the government, in fact, people did wake up. And they did say, wait a minute, we weren't, we didn't really think it was going to be that big a deal. But now, man, we're really in trouble. And again, historically, this will be the moment when people take a look at the extremism in the Republican Party and say, that's not who we are. That's not who we want to be. The thing that worries me is the degree to which they have sewn up what I call the nodes of democracy to make sure, in, for example, in states like North Carolina, that doesn't matter how many votes the, the Democrats get, they can't win a majority in the state house or a majority of the delegation. So one of the things that I think is really important for everybody to do going forward is to take up oxygen, to insist on voicing your concerns about democracy, what you want out of democracy. And crucially, I, I always say take up oxygen because that means talking to people. It means showing up at your, at your local government. It means going to uh, school board meetings. It means talking to your aunt. It means um, you know, not being afraid to say to people, hey, I'm scared about a guy who says that we should not have abortion rights in the United States. And then in the next breath says it would be good to have more workers so that then we don't have to worry about Social Security. I mean, these are these are so far extremist positions that they, in fact, have been adequate, you know, appropriately called fascist or Christo fascists. He's a self-declared evangelical Christian. So um so I think this is a terrifying moment, but it's also the moment where we really get to, to decide what our future is going to be. Take back our agency, take back this democracy, take back oxygen, and try and make this country what it really could be. And register people to vote because a huge percentage of the American public, they simply don't vote. I think we're running out of time I because I just saw Kitty. Um, <laughs> but I, I just want to remind everybody, the book is called Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. And um, Kitty, sorry, I think I went past my eight o'clock deadline. <laughs> sorry. No, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, wow. Uh, just what an incredible conversation, Katie and Heather. We are so, so grateful to both of you for coming to Big Ten. And despite it being a webinar, it really felt like a community. There was just a really active chat, which we will be sure to share with you afterward. And please, everyone, Ohio, Virginia, they need us. There was a lot of comments from people from those two states. So get involved. 
And it sounds like you'll come back to Big Ten. So I'm going to hold you to it because we love both your staffs. We've really enjoyed working them, working with them and meeting you too. It's just a dream come true. So good night, everyone. Thank you so much. We're going to make this happen. Let's save Great. democracy. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Thank Katie. you, everybody. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Katie. Yes.